guys, and welcome to another edition of the Brighton Jazz School podcast. This is episode 8, and I'm sort of doing a bit of a celebration um, podcast today, because um, uh, the, the day that I'm recording this is March the 8th, and it also happens to be James Williams' birthday today. So, um, James Williams, if you don't know who he is, he's a, a jazz pianist. Um, he sadly died in 2004. Um, and I studied with him on and off um, for a number of years and he had a profound effect on my life um, as a musician and just in general really. James was such a wonderful person and uh, he really inspired me to play and, and to uh, keep pushing this music forward, to keep telling people about this music and trying to get as many people um, interested in jazz as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dedicate most of the podcast to to James. We're going to do a slightly extended uh, album of the week featuring one of his albums, and I'm going to play a couple of tracks off that. We've also got the rest of the interview from last week with Jim White and Paul uh, Paul Sharp. So because um, we only got through half of that, it was a particularly long interview or chat really, rather than interview. But uh, yeah, so we've got the rest of that to look forward to. Uh, and we've we've got passing notes as well, all the usual slots for the for the podcast. But um, yeah, so this is a James Williams special, really. Okay, so before we get started, I'd like to draw your attention to a concert that the Brighton Jazz School students have uh, coming up on the twenty fourth of March, um, and that's Saturday. It starts at one thirty um, sharp, so the doors are open at uh, one pm. It's at the Brunswick Pub in Hove. The gig is for a charity. It's for um, Lynn Hazelden, who's been suffering from cancer. Um, she's uh, having to go to Israel to get her treatment. She, in the process of fighting her own battle, she's um, trying to sort of raise awareness of different cancer treatments that are kinder to your body. And she's having a lot of success with, uh, with the charities that she's involved with. So we're raising cash um, for, for Lynn and also for, um, for, for the charities that she works with, Kind of Choices and some others. So if you're around on the uh, 24th, please pop in. Tickets are £8 and they're going to be available from the Brunswick website very soon. If, um, if you can't get the tickets from the website, then email me directly. It's brightonjazzcool at gmail.com and I'll put you on the list and you can just pay on the door. But uh, lots of fun things going on that day. Auctions, we've got a raffle, we've got uh, various speakers coming in. We've got Verona Chard, who's a fantastic jazz singer, coming in and uh, I'll be playing a few tracks with her. So, And of course we've got the, the great Brighton Jazz School students who are going to be strutting their stuff, showing you what they've been up to uh, in, in the last few terms. So please, please, please try and make it along to that if you can. I've got a very exciting weekend coming up. I'm actually going to London, to Wembley on Sunday uh, to Tim Garland's house. Uh, Tim's a great saxophone player based in the UK, but he's worked quite extensively in the States, most notably with Chick Corea. Tim's a wonderful composer, and they have a band, or he has a band with two American musicians, Jeffrey Keezer, who uh, who you may have uh, <laughs> heard of. Um, I've been sort of going on about Jeffrey for, for many years. He's one of my favourite pianists, and uh, he's incidentally just become uh, a, a patron for Brighton Jazz School. So, um, so anyway, I'm going up to London on Sunday to do a, an interview with Jeff and hopefully Tim Garland as well, and to have a piano lesson. So I'm very, very excited about that. And then we're all going up, uh, I say we, I mean the Brighton Jazz School students and I um, are going up on Monday to see them perform live. They have a gig at the South Bank Centre, Purcell Rooms, and it's the Storms Nocturnes Trio, and that features Joe Locke on vibes, Tim Garland on sax, and Jeffrey Keys on piano. So if, you know, if you're around on Monday and you're in the, the London area, uh, it would be a great gig to go to. Uh, tickets are £15, you can get them directly from the uh, South Bank uh, website, South Bank Centre website, and you know it's beautiful music. Um, if you haven't heard them, go onto YouTube and type in Storms Nocturnes, and you'll find uh, some some great clips of them playing. They they don't play in the UK that often because uh, it's a pretty hefty task getting all three of them together and in the same country and at the same time. So uh, so it's a fairly rare occasion. So um, make the most of it while they're here. Uh, I think this I think this is a one-off concert, so um, now's your chance to see them. 
Okay, well, let's get cracking with the show. Thanks again for listening to us, and uh, click on subscribe in iTunes. Visit the Brighton Jazz School website, www.brightonjazzschool.com, to stay uh, connected to what uh, what we're getting up to. And, you know, grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the show. Welcome to Album of the Week, and as I said, this week we're doing an extended version, celebrating the life and music of James Williams, um, as it's his birthday today, the 8th of March. Um, James was actually born in 1951 in Memphis, Tennessee, and he began piano training at the age of 13, mostly in the Eastern Star Baptist Church in Memphis. He then went on to study music education at Memphis State University, where he met Mulgrew Miller and Donald Brown, who are two uh, superb pianists, um, both from Memphis. And, you know, they, they kind of uh, were friends. And the sort of patriarch of that group was Phineas Newborn Jr., who's a Memphis-bred pianist. And uh, there's there's an album of the week, I think, back in episode th- four. So check that out. We did a review of um, A World of Piano by him. So James was a wonderful person. Um, in fact... I can say that I've never met anyone quite like him. He would always put other people before himself. He would always put jazz before himself, you know, without a doubt. Uh, He really, really dedicated his life to this music and playing the piano. And just being a spokesperson for the music, you know, carrying on the rich heritage of the music, paying tribute to Phineas Newborn, of course, and other great musicians from Memphis, George Coleman, Harold Mayburn as another pianist, Frank Strozier. So after graduating, James moved to Boston, um, and he accepted a teaching position at Berklee College of Music uh, at the age of 22. He joined Alan Dawson's group about the same time, and as people came through Boston, artists such as Art Farmer, Milk Jackson, Sonny Stitt, Pat Martino, and of course Art Blakey, James sat in with Art Blakey during that time while he was in Boston, and he ended up uh, being in the band pretty soon after. Now, James was with uh, Art Blakey for about four years, and they recorded ten albums um, with various lineups. Uh, most notable was the Winton Marsalis, Bobby Watson, Billy Pierce, and Charles Farnborough uh, period. After he left the Messengers in 1981, he returned to Boston, joining um, Alan Dawson again, and there he got to play with some other great players such as Thad Jones, Joe Henderson, Clark Terry, uh, Chet Baker and Benny Carter. Now by this time James was obviously making a name, a name for himself so he, he decided to make the move to New York and uh, um, you know everybody's very glad that he did because he got to play with such great artists as Dizzy Gillespie, Ray Brown, uh, Art Farmer again, Kenny Burrell, Elvin Jones, Freddie Hubbard, Tony Williams. The list goes on, you know, every living legend of jazz, really. Now, throughout being a sideman to all of those great players, he was also, you know, he also had his own projects going, various albums in the 80s, and then he created um, the Intensive Care Unit. Now, this was a great band. And this um, featured two vocalists and a saxophone plus rhythm section. Um, various people played on it but this music was really going back to his gospel roots really um, making the music very accessible Uh, they would have very very clever arrangements you know with the horns and the voices and just very catchy tunes obviously the playing was brilliant but uh, he really reached a larger audience with this um, music and he uh, that was the whole point behind this project great album to check out from that band was the uh, Truth Justice and the Blues, that's a really fantastic album. Another great album to check out is the one he recorded for Sunnyside Records in 1984 called Alter Ego. Now that tune really has now become a sort of standard in jazz, really. It's a great tune, a sort of minor, uh, got these lovely 11th chords going down, it's just a beautiful song. He also, at that same time, dedicated two albums to uh, Phineas Newborn, comprising of a band of five piano players. Now this this project was called the Contemporary Piano Ensemble and it featured Harold Mayburn, originally from Memphis, Donald Brown, originally from Memphis, Mulgrew Miller, originally from Memphis, and a very, very young Jeffrey Keezer, uh, who's actually from Wisconsin, but quite often got uh, 
thrown in and <laughs> uh, an honorary Memphian, I guess. He was often associated with those guys um, to the point where people thought he was from Memphis as well. They released two albums, and the one I really love is called The Key Players, uh, which was recorded at, I think, Merkin Concert Hall in New York, and that features uh, those uh, those five piano players. Um, and they pay tribute to Phineas Newborn on that one. Now, James was a prolific composer. I talked to him at length many times on composing jazz and, and uh, you know, arranging. Of course, he was the musical director in Art Blakey's band, so he, he arranged many of the uh, songs that that band performed. Um, but pieces like Arioso, which he, he uh, composed for his nieces, Black Scholars, Alter Ego, so many, you know, and lots of other people love playing his compositions. Several of his compositions appear on albums by Art Farmer, Kenny Barron, Victor Lewis, Gary Burton and Roy Hargrove. So, you know, if those guys play it, they must be good. James is also very active in jazz education, teaching at various institutions around the world. Towards the end of his life, he was the director of jazz studies at William Patterson University, um, succeeding uh, Rufus Reed and Thad Jones. You know, from what I've heard, the students absolutely adored James. Um, James put me in contact with a student uh, who was studying there at the time, Steve Myerson, who's a great, great pianist. And funnily enough, we were both writing our dissertations on Finnish newborn. James put us in contact, so we, we sort of started this uh, uh, email uh, relationship for quite a number of years um, you know just sharing transcriptions talking about Phineas talking about James just you know our, our mutual love for the music and finally we got to meet um, when I went over to New York uh, when was it a couple of years ago now it's a really nice story we we obviously we'd known each other for about sort of six years and it, it really felt like we we were sort of best friends really um, having had the mutual friendship of James and our mutual interests in jazz, you know, especially Phineas Newborn. So when I went over to New York, um, we decided we could only meet in one place. There was only one place that we could ever meet. And of course, it was Steinway Hall in New York City. So, uh, so we met there and we had a, a good old play on some uh, absolutely stunning pianos. I think it was some days later after our first meeting, um, I, I went to see uh, Steve play at a gig uh, and then we decided to make a trip t over to William Patterson which is in Wayne, New Jersey and to talk to David Dempsey who's, uh, who's running the, uh, well, coordinating the, um, the jazz program there. Uh, Mulgrew Miller, who I mentioned before, who's also from Memphis and a good friend of James, uh, took over the teaching, uh, took over the, the directorship there. And um, it was a lovely trip. They've got a brilliant archive there with all of James's uh, material from his... Um, <laughs> the thing about James, he was sort of a collector. You know, he loved photographs. He loved really sentimental things, you know. So he had uh, notebooks full of uh, things that people had told him, uh, recommended albums, notes from people, you know, famous musicians that he'd met all sorts of things and so th the archive over at William Patterson is a, like a treasure trove of all of these wonderful things that that James had private recordings that were done in his own house and um, you know various unreleased uh, material so there as far as I know they're trying to get together a, uh, a sort of online version of the archive because um, there's thousands of photos like I said and you know, the world really needs to see these. So David Dempsey over at William Patterson is doing an absolutely amazing job. And I wait with great anticipation uh, for seeing all, all of these wonderful things that they've got over there. So James, um, as I said, uh, left us in 2004. He um, he had a very unexpected illness uh, of liver cancer. And having never smoked or drank in his life, you know, it was just one of those very unfortunate things. And... I, I met James literally about a month before he died. It was quite a profound experience for me. Um, he was playing a solo piano concert in Hazelmere, which is exactly the same place where I first met James. You know, it was such a magical meeting. I didn't really know that that would be the last time I would ever see him. Um, but I knew something wasn't, wasn't quite right with him. Uh, he'd lost a lot of weight and uh, um, just just looked very tired. 
Um, however, his playing on that night was nothing short of magical, and I'll never forget that concert. He wasn't happy with it, but <laughs> having heard James quite a few times over the years, uh, his playing was very, very spirited and very, very uh, in touch with the emotional connection that was happening in, in this wonderful church uh, in Hazelmere that night. So yeah, so the album of the week, I've decided to check out his album called Up to the Minute Blues, which uh, is a, just a superb album, features some uh, talented musicians. Uh, we've got Billy Pierce on tenor sax, James Williams on piano, uh, Ray Drummond on bass, and Billy Higgins on drums. Now, there's also a couple of other tracks that features uh, the great George Coleman, uh, tenor sax, Joe Henderson, tenor sax, and a new rhythm section uh, with James Jenis on bass and uh, James's nephew, Tony Reedus, on drums. Now, the album was recorded in September 1991 and again displays his sort of gospel and R&B uh, influences. Very soulful. But James was much more than just a, you know, a gospel influenced jazz pianist. You know, the, if you read reviews, that's, that, that tends to be what uh, what gets said about him. For me, I mean... You could hear the whole history of jazz piano in his playing. He'd really studied every single master. He loved Bud Powell. He loved Bill Evans. He loved Oscar. He loved, you know, obviously Phineas Newborn. But he also loved, you know, people like Donna Hathaway and uh, some of the great R&B people, Otis Redding, Ray Charles. And so all that came through in his playing. He was very, very accessible as a player. Um, but he could really turn up the heat, you know, when you hear him play with Freddie Hubbard, you know, in that in that all-star band. Wow, I mean, he can burn, he can really play like the best of them. You know, he cites a lot of different piano players, his influences, Hank Jones, the great Ahmed Jamal, Donald Brown, Mulgrew Miller. As I said, you know, the whole history of jazz piano is at his fingertips. They kick off the album with a tune by James Williams called Common Knowledge. Uh, which is a blues. Great, great soloing from everyone on that. Then they do a fantastic Joe Henderson tune called Afrocentric, which is very, very catchy, and again, some really great solos. The track three is an arrangement of Neil Hefty's Girl Talk, which is uh, quite a surprising choice. Um, they do it very differently to the way Count Basie approached it, but uh, I'm sure the good Count would love uh, love what they do with it. Then they move on to Three Card Molly, which is a, a composition by Elvin Jones. Now, it's curious because I don't always associate, well, I haven't associated Elvin um, with, uh, you know, as a composer, but that, that that's probably just me being uh, a bit ignorant there. So, um, but anyway, it really sort of typifies Elvin's sort of personality, very fiery, the way he plays. Um, just loads of full of energy and just a great, great burning tune. Then they do The Masquerade is Over. And then they finally, and then to close the album, they finish with another composition by James Williams called Up to the Minute Blues. So I'm going to be playing a few tracks from this uh, recording uh, a bit later on. So stay tuned. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, check out some James Williams albums. You know, James, although he wasn't really a household name like, uh, you know, Hank Jones or, or Kenny Barron, um, amongst the musicians, you know, we all knew the truth about James. He was a superb musician, a superb pianist, and a superb human being. Um, I've never met anyone quite like him, and um, I'll be very surprised if I meet anyone like him again. And it's safe to say that I owe uh, my playing career, um, my entire career, really, to James. He he sort of pushed me and kept me going when when uh, when I thought, you know. This this was uh, too getting too difficult, and he would always be at the other end of the phone, encouraging me and uh, telling me to you know make sure that I practice, and you know sometimes giving me a good kick up the ass, which is what I needed. Um, but he was always there. You know, I would get calls from him at you know one, two o'clock in the morning. He'd just come back from a gig, and he would leave uh, you know <laughs> two hour two hour messages on my answer phone saying. Hey Wayne, you know, I just got back and I've just been playing with John Patitucci and, uh, you know, I don't know, Mulgrew Miller was at my gig and, you know, and he, the other important thing about James is that he would always, if he wasn't playing, he would be at a gig himself, you know, I went to a gig when I was in New York with him, this was uh, maybe 10, I don't know, 10 years ago, and we went and saw Barry Harris at the Village Vanguard 
and he just loved he lived and breathed jazz you know it was his whole life and um I'm so proud to have dedicated Brighton Jazz School to James in his honour and uh, I urge everybody to go and check him out. Two words for you, both of you. Art Blakey. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Thoughts, you know. I saw Art Blake. He's oh really? really? Yeah, I saw him down at the um, uh, down at the King's West Centre in the eighties. It was yeah. one of the last things he did. Yeah. It was a bit of a disaster. Not musically, it was fabulous musically, yeah, yeah. but it was a bit of a disaster of an organisation. It was the first night of the festival, uh-huh. and uh, I got down there. I had tickets, and I got down there, and. Um, that was the band I think he had um, Winton Marsalis with him in yeah, those days. Yeah, my piano teacher was in that band. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, really? James Who was Williams. that? James Williams, of course. Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, we got down there. It was supposed to be for <coughs> nine o'clock. I got down there at about ten to nine. I saw an enormous crowd of people. And I thought, thank God I got tickets. Yeah, yeah. Um, I went to the front. They said, no, you've got to get on that queue. Well, the queue was about half a mile long. Wow. And they were all people with tickets. Wow. And we all got on the queue. And it was ages before we got And we got in the place. Uh, there must have been, it was a Friday night and um, I'd been at work all day yeah. and I was tired and it was getting late and there were no seats. There must have been about 20 seats and there must have been, I don't know how many thousands of people you can wow. fit in there. Wow. So it was all standing room only. So we stood and we waited and they played records and about um, 11 o'clock somebody announced over the microphone, good news ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Blakey has left the hotel. <laughs> My friend was with me. He said, "I hope the hotel's not in Chicago." Yeah. <laughs> and oh, uh, finally, they turned up. It must have been nearly midnight. Really? They turned up. Yeah. No, they and, don't bite one. You know, yeah. they don't want to hurry. Don't they? No, yeah, they were in no yeah. hurry whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose, but there's this attitude: jazz is for the late at night. I've never understood that. Oh, for me, yeah. jazz is for 24 hours a day. Yeah, yeah. If I don't sleep well and I wake up. At four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, I've got a tape ready, in, in, a, yeah. in, a, ready in a little old Roberts um, cassette player <laughs> wow. with my headphones ready just to listen to it go, yeah. in the middle of the night. And it does, yeah, 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 that's right. Uh, it's something to do in the middle of the night, you know. Yeah. And it sounds just as good to me at four o'clock in the morning. Absolutely. Um, or at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. Or at late at night or any time. Yeah. I don't, to me, it doesn't have to be a particular time yeah. of day. But there's something yeah. about... The way they program jazz, especially on BBC, yep. they seem yep. to think got to be late at night. Yeah, yeah. smoky, yeah. dingy Smoke, atmosphere. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what they did when smoking indoors got banned. Maybe that's why they don't Smoke play machines. so much anymore. Smoke oh, machines. is that what it is? Yeah, we, I was playing at a club actually a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we, it was obviously jazz, and, and they said, "Oh, you mind if we put a bit of smoke in here?" You know, and, and the smoke machine was right by the piano, and in the end, I had to, I had to say, you know, this is kind of off-putting. Is Maybe it real smoke? Not, I don't really well, know. Oh, it's no, dry no, ice. It's dry ice. It's not real smoke. It looks it's like smoke. It's pretty smoke. irritating, though. Well, that's, yeah. Is that to compensate just, for just, like a cigarette? Yeah, smoke? yeah, yeah I guess so. <laughs> just, just for effect. Who took all those iconic photographs <laughs> of all the jazz musicians with all with this oh, smoke? Oh, yeah. Do you remember who that was? I think was? it was, um, it was uh, Milton, um, the bass, you know, the bass player of Milton. It's quite a few. Hinton Milton. Milton Hinton, was it? Yeah, he he done a lot of jazz bass but I don't know if you took that another French the guy famous, the famous a, one, did a one. lot of famous well, uh, yeah but it had to have smoke in it yeah always otherwise it wasn't jazzy yeah I've never understood that because I've never been a smoker yeah, yeah no, no. I've always gone into back in the days when smoking was that I always go mm-hmm. in and move all the ashtrays and put them a long way away yeah. oh, and then see. somebody come along and grab the ashtray and shove it there and start smoking yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. well I, I remember in the uh, I saw a band, I can't remember who it was actually now, but at the, the old jazz cafe when they used to play the real jazz day, you know, yeah. and uh, they were smoking in there and, and uh, the band stopped and said, look, if, you, if you're smoking, can you go to the back because we're yeah. just getting yeah. all of this smoke, you know, so, it's, yeah, uh, it's, I, it's, yeah. it's you know, the smoking ban is such a great thing for jazz musicians. Absolutely, it's, it's a great uh, thing for yeah. jazz bands like vital. Me, yeah, of course. Yeah. Jazz and Everybody, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely, I say. absolutely. Yeah, back in you the don't 60s, really 
I went to um, Ronnie Scott's old place. First thing I did when I arrived from Australia mm. was to mm. go to Ronnie Scott's <laughs> old place. True and that used, to go, that used to go all night. Yeah. That used, it? Yeah. That used to start... I can't remember what time it started. It started about 11 o'clock yeah. and finished about 6 o'clock. In those days, there were no night buses. Mm-hmm. So it really started when the transport... It stopped when the transport yeah, yeah. started. And I just... I consider it, that's so considerate of them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep on. Oh, 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 I went in there, and in those <laughs> days, my real, one of my really big um, um, idols was Roland Kirk. Mm, yeah. but, oh, okay. You know, yeah, yeah. But I did, there was, Roland Kirk wouldn't have been on the bill, mm. but he happened to be in town. Right. And... Um, it was uh, typical jazz after hours because it was so late. Yeah. And I can't remember who was on the bill. I think it was Dudu Pakwana. I don't remember that, remember okay. that name. Remember that name? Dudu, Dudu Pakwana, lovely name. No, but no, Tubby no, Hayes no. was around in those days. I saw right. him down there and wow. a few others. And um, uh, Roland Kirk just turned up. Really? Yeah, with, you know, three instruments. <laughs> yeah. He used to play three instruments, a flute <laughs> and a... Stuffed a lot in his mouth. Yeah, all, <laughs> the, all at once. Yeah, all at once. I just thought I, I, thought I was having a dream yeah, yeah. that he would turn up. Wow. You know? Amazing. That's, you know, the, the, there's, there's something of a, of a theme with that, you know, yeah. these, these after-hours sessions. Yes. I remember going to... Um, actually, the first time I ever saw James Williams live yeah. was at the Pizza Express in Dean Street. And... Uh, I think I was about 17, and he, he, he announced that there might be some special guests, you know, yeah. and who, who would turn up sort of, you know, after their gig at the, at the uh, festival hall, but yeah. Winton, Marsalis, Joey Calderazzo, really? and yeah. uh, Jeff oh, Tain wow. Watts, oh, wow. and they were all sitting there in the corner. You know, can't ask for much playing. more. Was, you? Yeah, and they all got up, and uh, Jean Toussaint got up and played. Oh, well. and uh, just the wonderful on. sort of sense of community it's amongst fantastic. all these musicians. You know, it's yeah. really, really great. Um, but however good they are, are they really any better than the people we hear at these jam sessions? I really <laughs> don't think so. Well, the standard no, is very high. The standard yeah. is exceptionally yeah, it's very, high. Very high sure, yeah. You know, I mean. Not everybody is of the same standard, and you, you yeah. know it's welcoming to new people mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. so on. But we've got mm-hmm. some fantastic talent, to we're out. We're and, I, and as a jazz fan, yeah. uh, there's not one time that I come along that I don't say the same thing, mm-hmm. and and or is said to me, how lucky we are that we can come along yeah. and hear this yeah. for free, Absolutely. you know, for the price of a, of a drink or two, yeah. and these people are willing to turn up and play for nothing. Yeah, I mean, you've got, yeah. the, you've got the house band mm-hmm. and then you've got lots of people like you who just turn up and just, just sit in yeah. for the pure enjoyment of it. Now, that's true art. Well, that's jazz, you know, isn't it? That's, that's what jazz the is. Love, it? you know? There's it's always been that, that, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And go back to the Winton, Marcellus's band, like, all, you know, what you, what, like you were saying, I, I used, when I used to live in Manchester um, a few years ago, uh, it has... Orchestra were playing and, and Lincoln Bri- yeah, yeah. at the Bridge Bridgewater Hall in Manchester and they all came. I, I used to have a I think I used to have a residency at Martin Fred's for a couple of years yeah. and they all just came and sat in the whole band. You know, wow. well quite a few members of the band, that was quite an experience, you yeah, know, yeah, just yeah. getting they just all had just come, you know, finish their finish their jazz gig, head over to a jazz, you know, finish their big gig, yeah. you know, don't head off to the hotel, head out. Yeah, exactly. Play some more live music more and then and play more. Play more that's yeah. that's that's yeah. real love of music, isn't yeah, it? That. Yeah. You can't you know, they don't a lot just of go them. out and enjoy. They want to enjoy the rest of the night. And, yeah. 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 Yeah, fantastic. I think yeah. most jazz musicians, you know, I mean I I I've got stories of uh, well Benny Green's the one, I mean, I don't know if you've seen Benny play, but he Yeah, piano. He, yeah. Yeah. He will give because there's too many ah, greens. There is. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was. There was. Yeah. There was yeah, a critic. Lost. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Who also but played trombone as well, I think. He did play. He did yeah, play. I love yeah. That. yeah. But I know you mean. I know you mean the, the pianist. The pianist. Yeah, yeah. Superb pianist. And yeah. this guy, you know, he gives three hundred percent in the performance. You know, yeah. he just goes the extra mile every single time. Oh, he's a beautiful player. Night player, after night, yeah. beautiful player, great soul, and. Uh, you know, I saw him at Ronnie's, and um, he was sitting in. You know, the jam, they have the late night jam there. Yeah. And he was um, he was up there playing. And not only was he playing, but he was. Um, I had the pleasure of playing for him. Well, not for him, but you know, I was playing. Yeah. And he was in the room, yeah. and he was sort of looking over my shoulder. You know, zip, <laughs> not intimidating. Yeah, not yeah, I can't imagine that guy <laughs> would ever be intimidating at all. Just you know, such a lovely sport, guy, yeah. you know. And and he was. 
crazily looking at what I was doing as if to say, you know, it might have just been a, a very nice gesture, but as if yeah. to say, oh, I want to check out what you're doing. Yeah. And there's me thinking, you know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> I learned everything I, that I do from you. Yeah, but, but everybody the, learns. The there's, everybody can still learn. Doesn't yeah. matter how long you've exactly. been in the game, you can still learn. Totally. Yeah. But, but what a lovely guy. Um, yeah, George Coleman as well. Good. You know, I was, at the, oh, really? I was in New York a few years ago mm. and George is... You know, he's got a few years on him now. I don't yeah. know how old, probably 80 something. And, you know, I sat in there and he was what? there. He was what? he was at the smoke. Yeah. And I was there until four in the morning and he was still going. Yeah. There's me tired waiting to go home to the, to the <laughs> hotel and he's still yeah. he's still playing. But such beautiful people, you know, yeah. so much energy for the music. It transcends everything, you know. But, um, well, music. great. Look, guys, this is, this is fascinating stuff. Um, really appreciate you both being here yeah um, I want to say a special thank you to Paul um, who I think is certainly my oldest fan I don't mean that you're old I mean <laughs> yeah. I am old since I've been here <laughs> I think I met you pretty early on since moving well, here well I saw you play down at the um, underneath the greenhouse that's right about yeah, yeah. Um, eight years ago yeah and I thought this, this young oh. chap he, you know he looks like he's straight out of school and, and yet um, he seems to be playing like he's you know he's been at the piano for 30 years so I don't know how it didn't seem to gel somehow I didn't, didn't, didn't uh, okay. see how it worked oh well, thank where, you where did you get all that experience from I don't know I don't know I guess listening a lot well, yeah I felt much the same right. as I um, then uh, as I do now when I see Dave Drake yeah who you yeah. know is a teenager and I think yeah. where do you go from there mm. if you can play like that at that age yeah I know it's scary maybe America. you look maybe you just <laughs> yeah, look right. yeah. To, to New York <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, I mean, yeah, he's he's a great talent and certainly yeah. one to watch. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say a, a, a big thank you to you for, well, for following much, us Wayne. and coming to the gigs. And it really does... Um, you needn't thank me, I should be thanking you because well, you've given me a huge amount of pleasure. Well, it really, you know, it works both ways. Because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's nice to see familiar faces at gigs and, and you know, it makes it all worthwhile. Uh, it really does. So, yeah, so a big thank you to you. And Jim, what can I say? You know, it's such a pleasure playing with you on the bandstand and you, oh. you're a consummate musician. And uh, the thing I love about your playing is, you know, that you listen, you know, and you respond and it's, it's a two-way thing and it's so much fun playing with you. So I hope hope we can play together some more. Oh, if I'm so um, with you. Likewise, likewise. Cool. Absolutely. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining well, me. And, you, uh, you know, I hope you enjoy the interview and, and uh, keep listening to the podcast. And check these, you do. know, come down and hear Jim play uh, at the Brunswick. And where, where can we find out where you're playing and gigs and stuff? Uh, my website, usually. Okay, yeah, which probably, is? It's uh, jimwhite.com. Jimwhite.com. With, 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 with a Y. With a Y, yeah. With a Y, yeah. Okay. Jimwhite.com. I put, um, I usually put my... Uh, up and coming things on there so Great. it's usually that. okay yeah anything in the pipeline locally uh, well uh, locally yeah I'm playing with that funny you should mention Dave Drake I've got a yes. gig with Dave Drake next week in Brighton you know, like young, uh, oh where's that that's at the Foundry which is Foundry. A, quite a small oh yeah but really what, in the lanes it's in the lanes yeah, yeah. it's in the Brighton lanes okay. um, so on Foundry Street part, yeah. funnily enough okay and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite really do you know the date and time off, it's, off it's the 7th of March very good probably starting about 8pm or something okay. like that so that would be go. nice quite a brilliant yeah come, come check yeah, it out yeah there you go folks that's the place to go so 8th of March the foundry did you say 7th? 7th? 7th yeah sorry seventh sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry 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 Wednesday. Wednesday the 7th <laughs> yeah. Wednesday the 7th um, but yeah check out check out uh, jimwhite.com and uh, you, you'll get uh, you know you see Jim play and uh, yeah Paul's always down at the Brunswick so come and say hi to Paul as well he's such an interesting guy um, history teacher I believe uh, retired history retired teacher history I taught history, teacher, taught yeah. history for just over 30 years and I, yeah. I got used to it after a while yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just about getting used to it when I retired <laughs> <laughs> history of jazz that would have been a, that, that would be a good one yeah. that would yeah. be a good one but yeah. actually everything's got a history yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, I wish I, uh, I, just from talking to you over the years, I wish I had a teacher who's sort of passionate and knowledgeable. Um, well, I think you did have a teacher of music who was passionate and well, knowledgeable. Well, actually, I certainly did, yeah, yeah, uh, James Williams, but what a guy. But, um, Absolutely. yeah, fantastic player. But certainly album, album of the week and uh, some, uh, maybe a whole show dedicated to James at some point, because obviously the whole jazz... Um, uh, school is is basically 
uh, comes from the inspiration of James and what, what I'd learnt from him. So I'm sort of passing on, hopefully uh, keeping his uh, spirit legend. <laughs> le- legend alive yeah, yeah. Through, through, the, through the students. And, well, a good um, teacher brings out what's already in there and I think that that's what he's, he's done in your case. Oh, well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, guys. So it's been a great interview. Thank you for joining us, and uh, I'll see you very soon. Great. Right. Cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. So there's no passing notes this week, um, and the reason for that is because the students are busy preparing uh, for the showcase concert on March the 24th. So, um, so basically, the last learn to play session was dedicated just to, uh, you know, practicing and rehearsing. So we hope you can make the concert there. I'd like to just say a few thank yous before we end the show. First of all, to Paul and Jim for joining me for that great interview and chat. That was a first with the two. Uh, two interviews at the same time two people at the same time but i think it worked really well um i'd like to say thank you to the glue of brighton jazz school mr mike who has been working his magic on the podcast and also thank you to you guys my loyal listeners stay tuned for next week's podcast because we have one of the best jazz pianists in the world mr jeffrey keezer joining us um, for a very special podcast edition next week don't miss that one whatever you do Okay, so if you'd like more information on our courses, please visit www.brightonjazzschool.com. Uh, we offer two courses, uh, just, just as a heads up here. We offer Learn to Play, which is a practical course that runs over three terms uh, throughout the year, 10-week terms, um, and any instruments and vocalists are welcome, whatever your level. Um, and we run that on a Tuesday from 11 till 6 p.m., and then there's a jam session in the evening at the Brunswick as well. I also run a sort of history stroke listening course, um, giving you some ideas about what to listen out for when you when you hear jazz, you know, what makes jazz so special, and some of the more historical facts and figures uh, about, uh, about the things in the jazz world, famous albums, you know, the lives of uh, some of these great musicians. Um, and I run that on a Thursday between 6 and 8 p.m. So if you live in Brighton and you're a jazz fan and you don't play anything, but you still want to sort of be a part of the community, that will be a great place to come and uh, just hang out with us and get to know the people. All my students are very lovely, very welcoming, and uh, we're always looking for uh, new recruits, as it were. So you'd be more than welcome to join us on either one of those courses. If you live a bit further away and you can't get to Brighton or you know you live very far away, then stay tuned because the boffins at Brighton Jazz School are working very hard to get some exclusive online content up on the website. Um, and that's a really exciting development for us. So we're going to be having uh, courses available online uh, with lots of interaction, lots of great things. The, the way it's delivered is going to be quite unique. So, And, you know, they're going to be tailor-made as well. So this is a really exciting uh, prospect for us. So stay tuned for that. Watch this space. And as ever, if you'd like to donate and support us, either just for the podcast or for Brighton Jazz School, uh, as a whole, then uh, you can visit www.brightonjazzschool forward slash podcast and there is a donation button on there. Um, and obviously every donation um, does make a real difference and uh, it's very, very, very uh, appreciated. All right, so that's about it for me. Um, thank you again for joining us and be sure to come back next week because, uh, like I said, we've got a fantastic podcast for you next week, the great Jeffrey Keezer. Um, in the meantime, have a great week and we'll see you very shortly. I'm going to leave you in the very capable hands of my teacher, Mr. James Williams, and uh, we're going to play you out here with uh, one of his compositions called Black Scholars. So thanks again. Have a great week. And this is Wayne signing out.